My first interaction with the Zelda series was when my dad bought Twilight Princess for a Wii after pestering him about the game for months. I was absolutely obsessed with it. I was taking the fucking manual to the dumb stupid after school program to read it during breaks. Yeah, I was that asshole. I loved everything about this game. Well, except for actually playing it. I got stuck in the tutorial. I ended up dropping Twilight Princess for being too hard. Of course, I could have looked at a walkthrough on YouTube, but to my 9 year old brain that was a place for Sonic AMVs and Sonic AMVs only. What am I saying? I started crying like a little bitch because I wasn't able to get past the tutorial. It took some time to go by, but I decided to give the game another chance in anticipation for Breath of the Wild, and after finishing it, I fell in love with it. You could guess my confusion when I went on the interwebs and learned that, yeah, Toy Princess doesn't have the best reputation, so I've taken it upon myself to spread the good word of this amazing game. Yep, yeah, I'm the only one. No one thought to do this before. It's the Legend of Zelda and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Octorox Tech Tech's levers too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go Link, yeah, get Zelda. Awesome. We start off in Ordon Village, doing normal everyday stuff like fishing, herding goats, learning how to use the sword, saving the town children from monsters. You know, the usual chosen one is no personality business. Except that it's actually part of the stuff and caring, contrary to what the marketing might have you believe. This part works as a tutorial to teach you the game's mechanics, for example, by herding the goats you learn how to use a pona, and by saving the kids you learn the basics of combat. From a player's perspective, this may seem boring, because it's supposed to be this way. By showing how mundane Link's life was before going on his adventure helps with his development from a normal farm boy to the hero of Twilight. They did a similar thing in Wind Waker, except that in that game, instead of playing those parts, you just see them in cutscenes. You could say that this is a bad example of show don't tell, then again, I might just be looking too hard in things and praising bad game design. Of course not, that would be silly. The next day Link is supposed to deliver a sword to Hyrule Castle, but just before leaving the village gets attacked by a band of wokoblings that kidnap the children while leaving Link unconscious. When he wakes up, he runs after the raiders only to be met by an ominous wall. Our hero gets dragged inside the Twilight Realm, taking the form of a beast. After his transformation, Link is then dragged to Hyrule Castle where he wakes up in a prison cell. This is the first time you meet Midna, the Twilight Princess. That's the title of the video game! Back it up! We have achieved comedy! At the top of the tower you find Princess Zelda. She explains that her castle was attacked by the Twilight King Zant. Unable to do anything, Zelda surrendered, and the lands of Hyrule were flooded by Twilight. Link and Midna then get transported back to Ordon Village with Link still looking like a wolf. After getting a sword and a shield, you head back into the Twilight Realm, where you meet the first Spirit of Light. They were separated into multiple fragments called the Tears of Light, and it's up to us to find all of them. We are now introduced to the wolf gameplay. In the first half of the game, you have to run around as Wolf Link in every region in order to restore light to said region. This offers a way to explore before heading there as Human Link, for example, maybe you find a spot that only he can reach. When a player remembers that and later heads there, after clearing the twilight, they get a sense of accomplishment, even though the designers purposely put that there, so you cannot really miss it. After returning the light, Link transforms back into a human rocking his iconic green tunic. It is here that the gameplay loop of going into the twilight realm, connecting all the tears of light and completing dungeons starts. Legend of Zelda, a never-ending adventure new for your Nintendo Entertainment System. Zelda! I am sure most of you would agree dungeons are one of the most important parts of Zelda. While in Twilight Princess most of them are similar mechanically, they make up for it in their aesthetics. No two are alike. All of them have a set team they follow, and I feel like the best example of this is one of the fan favorite dungeons, the city in the sky. The aesthetic of a flying city that used to be inhabited by an old society long gone is executed flawlessly. 
From the flying bird thingies that I forgot the name of circling around the city, to moving parts of the temple around in order to reach new places. This is also the best place they could have introduced the double claw shot. Swinging from wall to wall in order to avoid the falling floor and pulling flying enemies towards you feels amazing and reinforces the fact that every game is better when you have a grappling hook. I would also like to talk about the final boss of this dungeon. Upon reaching the highest point of the city, you fight Argorok. The giant dragon you were able to see earlier in the dungeon. Wow, is that foreshadowing? In order to defeat it, you have to grapple onto its back using the double claw shot I mentioned earlier. It is an amazing fight just thanks to its sheer scale. If you want to beat that guy, you could say that the fan favorite fight against Morphil is similar, but that one never really did much for me since it was overshadowed by everyone's favorite scene in this game. After defeating the aforementioned fishfuck, the player meets with Zand face to face for the first time. He takes away the pieces of the fierce shadow that you've spent the first half of the game gathering, turns Link into a wolf and exposes Midna to the power of the light spirit, mortally injuring her. For context, up until that point Midna didn't show any affection nor trust towards the player or anyone in the light realm for that matter, so there was no reason to empathize with the imp, but seeing her at her lowest point and generally caring about you makes both Link and you, the player, intensely motivated to reach Hyrule Castle as soon as possible. And the way there isn't exactly what I call a walk in the park either. Once again the player is forced to travel the normal world as the wolf link with your dying partner struggling to breathe as the music ramps up in intensity. However, through a mastery of the wolf controls, we reach the catacombs which we once escaped. Once you finally reach Zelda, this moment still ends on a sad note. The problem isn't solved that easily. She gives up her life in order to save Midnas. However, you also get rewarded for your trouble, and that reward is the Master Sword, making you stronger than ever before and motivating you to keep going so that Zelda's sacrifice wouldn't be in vain. While we're here, I would also like to elaborate on the combat a bit more. Twilight Princess is definitely the most combat-oriented Zelda game to date. I only wish that it was better developed. Now, I will give credit where credit is due. The restrictions of the world are used to emphasize the helplessness in the aforementioned scene, but I think Dog had more potential. Almost all of his moves are mapped to the A button, and many of the combat encounters could be summarized to mash A in order to win. Another stupid move he has is the ability to cross long gaps by mashing, you guessed it, the A button and sometimes timing it. If only he could learn some more moves like normal Link in order to spice up the combat. And since I'm here, all the extra moves you can learn from the Hero of Time are very fun to use. It's a shame that they are optional, because that means the developers can't add monsters that adapt to your fighting style or that are weak to specific moves. Don't get me wrong, they are useful, but the anime AI does let you use the ones that charge up since they all mindlessly run at you. In Breath of the Wild they implemented the pirate system which I think helps medicate the problem, but we hope we'll miss if the perfect dodge timing is. The flurry rush gets way too old once you learn how to do it consistently. A good way to improve on the combat would be combining the secret techniques from Twilight Princess with the pirate system of Breath of the Wild and completely eliminating the flurry rush. I'm a little disappointed that Tears of the Kingdom seems to have the same moveset as Breath of the Wild, but it was to be expected since it is running on the same engine. I digress. Now, this game isn't only about dungeons and killing stuff, there are also side quests. By that I mean not a lot. At least compared to the countless optional stories of Majora's Mask. Yeah, these game side quests are just kinda bland and boring fetch quests, almost none of them are that interesting. At least the mini games are good, I guess. FYI, I hit the Malomart quest. If I had to take something out of this game, that would be it. Even Agita can stay, just remove the weird Nene baby, okay Nintendo? Speaking of side content, there is also the stuff to do in Hyrule Field, which was, at the time, the biggest most filled iteration. Before you ask, the Great Sea does not count since it was boring to traverse and there were way too few islands. Oh, but this one is just as empty, I hear you screaming, alone, in your room, at 3am. And the thing is, I thought the same thing at first. 
I have a very distinct memory from when I was little, searching for heart pieces in the wild and finding a hidden cave that had the same style as the second dungeon. While this may not seem like such a big deal, it kind of made me curious to explore for some more secrets and to search for various locations where I could use the items I've gathered, and to put it simply, no other games made me feel that until then. That's what Zelda games have been doing ever since the first one, they have been challenging your curiosity to explore these fantasy worlds alongside your main character. Unfortunately, these worlds are not limitless, and the journey must come to an end. And what an ending it is. Finally entering the Twilight Realm is as climactic as I expected. The music in the Twilight Control Zones have always made me feel uncomfortable with all the scenes and whatnot. As for the dungeon, I didn't feel like the puzzles that much. Taking the light orbs through these rooms gets serious really fast. I mean, at least the original? The thing that saves this dungeon is the final encounter with Zant using the true form of the Master Sword. It may start as a boss rush, but in the end, when you fight him without any cheap gimmicks, he breaks his facades and starts rushing you with attacks, revealing that he's just a big baby that raged with because he couldn't beat the tutorial. After brutally murdering him, you're off to Hyrule Castle to confront Ganon, which was foreshadowing a cutscene all the way back in Arbiter's grounds, which you would have remembered if I actually showed the footage beforehand. Before fighting him, you have to infiltrate the castle to get to the top. The final encounter is a test on everything you've learned throughout the game. You find multiple darkness at once, every item is used. You have to jackal between human and wolf form. Even pig riding is utilized. Yeah, bet you forgot that was in the game. Now you haven't heard this from me, but there are even extra keys that you can get to skip some puzzles if you actually explore instead of following the most obvious path. This one area has more to do than any other dungeon. Absolutely love it. The tension hits its peak when you get to the top, enter the throne room and see Ganon waiting for you alongside. Oh, who's that up there? Yeah! Zelda is back for some reason. I lied to you. She isn't actually dead. Why is she back? Who knows? The game tricked me! The battle against Zelda is nothing to write home about, it's just energy dance from Ocarina of Time. The second phase, however, hits out of the park when it comes to theatrics. Ganondorf transforms into his beast form and you need to make use of Wolfling to stop his movement, smash him to the ground and literally dig into his weak point. The third phase switches to horse riding, where the player has to get into range for Zelda to shoot Ganon down with light arrows. Not the most exciting, but I do appreciate the diversity with the fight, and since this was the first Zelda game to feature horseback sword fights, it was kinda necessary. After knocking Ganondorf down, the final phase starts. A 1v1, no items, on Hyrule Field. I absolutely love the atmosphere of this battle, from the way Ganon swings his weapon to the way he towers above Link. It's all amazing, and don't even get me started on how finishing the fight with the first secret move you makes you think back on your whole adventure, and that's, you know, a little cherry on top of this perfect encounter. I like to compare Twilight Princess to Dragon Quest XI. While it may follow a certain formula, the game doesn't suffer from it and takes pride in its legacy. In recent years, many of my favorite franchises jumped to open world, and while all of those games are great steps forward, I feel like I've gotten tired of that gameplay style. I know for a fact that after Tears of the Kingdom I'll be taking a break from buying any new open world games. There is a reason the Zelda series has been following the template set by Ocarina of Time all the way back in 1998, and I hope we'll see a return to it, maybe in a smaller budget project. Twilight Princess is not a perfect game, the story may be linear, however, that focus on linearity is exactly what gives me the motivation to get through these dungeons. Even after I knew everything that happened, every story I've carried the same emotional weight as on my first playthrough. <sighs> Fuck you Nintendo for faking me, that's death.